Thank you so much for coming. We're all very, very delighted to have you. And welcome to all of you. Before we begin, I would like to just read one or two short lines from His Holiness's book, Ethics for the New Millennium, just to frame the concept of ethical revolution. He begins in the first chapter, His Holiness is talking about how material progress alone is not solving the world's problems with environment or with war or with crime or violence and so forth. And there has to be an internal development to go along with it. You don't often get an invitation to uh, hang with the Dalai Lama, and uh, you know the Dalai Lama is, you know, he's big. You know, he's uh, he's a major presence. And he's someone who transcends the usual categories of leadership and, dare I say, celebrity in America. I mean, he speaks with such authenticity at a time when there's so little in this country. And also, I think he brings a sense of of uh, charming hope. Dalai Lama teaches to take the blinders off. Well, for me, I really want to know like what's going on, what's the nature, what's their beliefs, what's their beliefs on the peace and everything. I don't think you can ever underestimate the importance of somebody standing up and reminding us of the right behavior. The Dalai Lama has that power. He's able to grab a hold of people and move them. So it's for... Uh hope, you know, see what's going on, what some of the good people are thinking. We have to greet his homeless, yes we do. We're the hosts, we have to greet him when he comes out of the car. The discussion on ethics uh, that, that His Holiness wishes to have by writing his book, Ethics for the New Millennium, uh, we thought it would be important for him to have that discussion with people who might be open to that idea of the eth ethical revolution. And by that he means something other than the various revolutions that we've seen. They were revolutions that tried to change things by changing the outer arrangements of society. And they mostly led to more of the same under different headings. <laughs> he argues that we need an inner revolution, a revolution that draws from an inner dimension. Then he very carefully distinguishes that from a religious revolution. In the Buddhist view, ethics is not grounded in religion or in some sort of from another world, you know, from on high. Ethics is grounded in human biology. Ethics is more powerful. Ethics is more realistic. You have to have revolutions in your heart. You have to have revolutions in your mind in order to be able to change society in positive ways. <laughs> If you look at many spiritual traditions of the past, including Buddhism, a great emphasis has been placed on articulating the wisdom through language, scriptures, and so on. And in fact, in Buddhism, of all the various activities of the enlightened person, his teaching, his speech, is considered to be the most important avenue of uh, the enlightened action. So. This is particularly the case in the modern society where media plays a such a pervasive and influential role. And then another thing, you know, one of the very important sort of instruments to check people, whether politician or economist or religious leader or any level, whether they're doing mischievous things or not. So I usually say call media people, you should have long nose, like, <laughs> what say, like elephant, elephant, and then smell here and there, uh, provided be very objective, very sincere, very honest, very truthful, all such things. I think the media is very, very important. Um, I think that uh, the two points that you make about curiosity and seeking the truth are very, very important and critical at this time because we're losing our perspective. And it's certainly been encouraged that we get less information on the part of the conglomerates that are buying up and controlling the media. And that's very insulting to people who, who are trying to stay awake in their lives and want information. Um, you know, it, gets, it goes back to the, the Garden of Eden. 
you know, are we really as human beings interested in giving up knowledge and not eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge in order to be taken care of? Are we so frightened that we really don't want to know? And even when the lies are so blatant, not ask for the truth, not ask for accountability, as you say. The populations of America, which is, of course has a very powerful impact on the rest of the world, need access to other people's views than the ones they get from the corporate controlled media, which has become more or less propaganda from the point of view of almost everyone else in the world. And, but the Americans don't know that, and they think they're getting real stuff from the news, which are mainly they're getting kind of government commercials and corporate commercials. They should hear from the Dalai Lama. They should hear from Bishop Tutu. They should not just hear from these and that supposed media commentators and pundits. There are, these people are pundits, and yet they have a different view. They see, they see the interests of other people in a certain way. And if that kind of view was more widely available to people, I think people would make much better decisions. I'm deeply honored to be here with you, Your Holiness. I edit a weekly political magazine. I think the question that faces us is how do those of us in the media revitalize the civic powers that are so important to an ethical society? How does a journalist feel anger at the daily outrages we witness and still act as an effective, humane watchdog to be critical-minded but not relentlessly oppositional? I think we need to create alternative structures in which journalists can uh, be ethical and speak with the values that inform um, so much of the world that goes uncovered. You know, I mean, do we see the fact that, you know, there's extraordinary global inequality in this world? Do we see the movements fighting for change in the streets around this world? Do we see the excitement of that? No, because there's a kind of suffocating consensus in too much of our media, which is to commercialize, but it's also a mindset that we must be practical. We must look only at what Wall Street's doing today. Why not Main Street? That doesn't enter into the discourse of too much journalism. The nation was founded by abolitionists in 1865 to fight the evils of slavery, and we have always believed that there is no force so potent in politics in life as a moral issue. Without the noble tradition of torchbearers of investigative journalism, I think our society, as so many others, does not have the accountability does not. Walter Cronkite, I think, who is a major media figure and a major media conglomerate, speaks out eloquently against the dangers of the bottom line in terms of what constitutes news in our country. If there was more of a critical mass, you could see establishment figures trying to at least reform. You're not going to see a revolution, as the Dalai Lama would like to. That is not realistic, but I would say evolution, not revolution, is a first step. I am a realistic idealist, and I believe there are extraordinary changes which bring hope. The new technologies of the internet and digital video have brought about a new generation of independent journalism that is being created directly by the participants in political movements and campaigns. And instead of being the subjects of the mass media, millions of people are making their own media and talking back to official journalists. A kind of revolution, perhaps an ethical one, against media consolidation and for democracy and diversity. Millions of people are waking to reclaim the airwaves for our democracy and telling our government loud and clear that we don't want to live in a world with one voice. So I have hope that a media that is made by people who are responsive to the public interest to their interest of the audience as opposed to the interests of their owners or their advertisers is far more likely to bring about a revolution. And I believe in the end the full story will come out because someone is heading into the cave with a torch. Uh, regarding criticism, I think criticism is very uh, very important. But then also, it is also very natural for human beings when you are subject to criticism, instead of examining whether there is any basis, substance for this criticism, your immediate instinctive reaction 
tends to be that of negative defensive uh, reaction. So therefore, I always is telling uh, the people who are working for promotion of nonviolence, we must show uh, the nonviolent method to tackle the problem. Without that, just to say peace, 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 not much meaning. Uh. Now, like the sense of Iraqi crisis, when you say just to oppose the uh, what say the uh, war or violence, it's of course very right, but not sufficient. We must show the method how to solve is that. Uh, so therefore, now uh, media, when you when you make some critical uh, sort of comment, and at the same time show the method or the alternative, then this, I think the other side could read as a support, helper. No. Then the, truly the, that criticism is a result of sense of responsibility, not just a mere criticism. Mm -hmm. So this is Amy Goodman. I come from Pacifica Radio, which was founded just after World War II. Founded by a man named Lou Hill, he said there has to be a media outlet that is not run by corporations, corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born. The media is the way most people understand the rest of the world. We either have experiences ourselves with our neighbors, that's how we learn about things, we read, or we watch what is taking place on television. And seeing that through a corporate lens, through the lens of, say, NBC, which is owned by General Electric, one of the major nuclear weapons manufacturers in the world, it's no accident that war looks like a military hardware show. After 9-1-1, that horrendous crime against humanity. The, you can't call them journalists, but the media personalities on television started to intone the number 90%. 90% of Americans are for war, they said. Who was asked? Were you called? And if in fact people were polled, what was the question? If people were asked, do you believe the killing of innocent civilians should be avenged by the killing of innocent civilians, more than 90% of Americans would say no. And that is not the story that we got in the mainstream media. Instead, it, as Noam Chomsky says, manufactures consent for war. You move forward now to the invasion of Iraq. You have the Pentagon researching what is the most effective propagandistic name they could call this to manipulate how people would view it. They called it Operation Iraqi Freedom. They actually had another name. That was Operation Iraqi Liberation, but they realized the acronym O-I-L, and they thought, no. <laughs> Operation Iraqi Freedom. Now, that's the Pentagon's name. But if you look at how the broadcast networks covered this invasion, they incorporated that name into their logos, not just at Fox, but at NBC and MSNBC, it was called Operation Iraqi Freedom in their pictures. They adopt the same names as the Pentagon. When that happens, these logos make you ask, if we had state media in this country, how would it be any different? The kind of information that's being put forward, unquestioned, unsourced, is inexcusable because it really is a matter of life and death. If we saw the casualties on the ground in Iraq on a regular basis, 
to honestly portray who is behind that terror in every circumstance. It varies, but also it is all too often the same in those other situations. We hear about these military regimes that are backed by the most powerful military on earth, and that is the United States. And we have to understand those links. We are in a new century, a new millennium. And the media needs to reflect that and honestly convey the hell and the gore of war. All of us get by with hope and work together because we have that hope of a better world. Maybe someday we'll all be together in Tibet celebrating with you. Thank you very much. In the United States, the criticism towards one's own government or some of the policy freely is, I think, uh, a very positive sign. I don't think the thing of the Shashavati next week is going to be a good I'm sure that as a result of our airing this criticism in public here, there would not be an immediate kind of uh, uh, retribution that we will suffer, say, at least in the next week or so. I don't think. I don't think. In any case, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> uh, uh, So I always telling uh, my American friends for many years, uh, the real American strength is not weapon, but democracy, rule of law, justice. But in the field of international relations, that democratic principle is not there. No still relying on show of force. And that's backward. So the real method, personal contact, person to person, face to face, talk, then listen, his view, what is his complaint? And the terrorism is because of mutual suffering. They also suffer. Right? Uh, so therefore, Need try to find a way to solve uh, which causing their complaint. That's the proper way. That's the human way. Some representative government or even the United Nations, I think, unfortunately, now you see many people too much suspicion and distrust. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you see, they're very difficult. So there's some individual who really people looks no political agenda or interest, sort of respected people, including Nobel laureate, as a group, and should take more active role on behalf of humanity, mm -hmm. not this government or that government or United Nations. Simply, warm heart, with sense of, I say, the responsibility of humanity and group then I think mm, there is some ground trust. Then listen first to their view and explain. If war started, what the benefit? When, when Your Holiness goes with uh, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela and Jimmy Carter and all of these people in the nonviolence SWAT team, Amy will cover you. Amy Goodman will go with you with the microphone. He was very funny today because he's realistic. He says, you can't just say peace, peace, peace. You must show people that there are nonviolent paths that will bring security and that will bring more security and human security and really fight terror than the violent path we've, we've undertaken.
if he were more accessible to the world on television, in the media of mass media of communication, he would have an enormous impact, which is probably why the propaganda media doesn't give him a great deal of play, in fact. The Dalai Lama's message cannot be captured by the mainstream media today because they rely on sound bites. And when you're not just repeating the accepted wisdom, you need time to explain what it is you're saying. And if they don't get it, they just sound odd or they're not included at all because they don't give good sound bite. Uh, yeah, the Dalai Lama should be proud of that fact. This afternoon, I'd like to build a case for hope, for a sense that we are at a turning point in history, and that my field, socially responsible investing, has a pivotal role to play in it. Bringing investments into alignment with personal values makes sense to a lot of people, because a healthy society depends on healthy roots, in our case, healthy grassroots. Ethics has come under attack as something that's not core to who we are and what we do. It is what made the nation function originally. But they have increasingly come under attack, and certainly in the last 25, maybe even 50 years, uh, ethics have become some kind of an academic study set aside from business practice. There is no they creating the conditions of global disaster. We are the problem. Corporations increasingly rule the world. They are, however, only there to serve you and me. In America, $7 trillion is invested in mutual funds. That's half of American capital. The average holding period in most mutual funds is six months. I don't own the company. I'm renting a ride. I don't care what that company is going to do in nine months. I care what they're going to do right now. CEOs get paid a lot more, millions and millions of dollars more, if the stock goes up this quarter. So Unical contracts for oil in Burma, resulting in the enslavement of thousands. And General Motors contracts for lead from Peru, resulting in the poisoning of thousands, and so forth. The system is geared toward producing one result, putting a little money in your wallet. To make decisions that, at least on the surface, appear to be contrary to the best interest of Wall Street is a very big decision for a CEO or an analyst to make and one which probably could cost them their jobs. Values must become integral into the investing process. Universal human dignity and ecological sustainability must be the goal of all finance. Investors are not passive creatures. They are not merely along for the ride in some trend that they've identified. They're creating the trend. We know that we can make a difference. We have the tools, we have the structure, and we cannot afford to fail. Thank you. And definitely I believe that this is a very skillful and actually very effective method of using one's uh, investment um, for ethical purposes, for example, shareholders and mm. people who buy stocks to make sure that they don't invest in companies that have destructive implications. Yes, okay. And, uh, Russell? You know, we're here for a short time, and as His Holiness says, and, and all the good books remind you that the only uh, wealth is really well-being and happiness. And no success that I've ever had came from anything that I didn't give before I got it. And that principle of giving, you know, as part of a, a conscious business makes you a much better businessman. You know, for many years... For many years I thought that I was a, a taker. I was producing all of this music and movies and things, and, and I thought that I was trading with the world, but I was really working hard to share things I loved and give service to the world. So to remind business people, corporations, and others that to endear yourself to the world and to the community is what makes you successful. Thank you. Now the corporate advice synergy. 
he had discussions with people who offer consultancy for business and corporations, particularly in the, in the role of ethics in business. And one of the things that he had been doing is to really convince the CEOs of the major corporations that in fact to bring ethical principles into the corporate practice is really in the self-interest of the corporates, corporations themselves. So you spoke from your own personal experience of how when giving becomes part of your business habit, you know, it becomes successful. So, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, as, as I understood, the, the assignment was. Uh, <laughs> uh, what would it be like if I ran the zoo? Um, you know, so uh, originally, uh, you know, religion and government acted as uh, checks on the power of business. Right now, the politicians that are making the laws are essentially bought and paid for by the corporations that they're supposedly regulating. Uh, that don't work. You know, the experiment that we underwent at Ben & Jerry's uh, was to figure out whether business is inherently evil. And uh, <laughs> what we found was that it's not, that business is essentially a neutral tool. And at Ben & Jerry's, we made a very deliberate effort to see if it was possible for a corporation to be a reparative force in the society. If you can't find a way for, for business to act in a more socially beneficial manner, we're never going to, you know, solve the problems of the society. And so, you know, I think it's, I think it's key to uh, actualizing the spirituality and, and the philosophy of, of Buddhism for, for business. Being socially beneficial became our unique selling proposition. You know, I mean, yeah, it's good ice cream, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that, the, that the company... <laughs> that the company was using its uh, power to help improve the quality of life in its communities was another major motivating force. If I ran the zoo, uh, I'd do some more stuff. I'd pass legislation that reduced the maximum salary that a CEO could get to be... You know, why, why should the CEO of a major corporation earn more money than the President of the United States? Why don't we just say, that's as high as you can get. The owner makes all the money. <laughs> <laughs> they all, all paid, but the owner makes all the money. I got a proposal for, for them the too, yeah. yeah, yeah. Get a plan for them. I, 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 got, I got a tax on windfall profits. You know, so that uh, companies that are uh, basing their business model on the idea of maximizing quarterly profits would end up being penalized. And this would force companies to have to base their decision making on the long-term benefit, on long-term profitability. It's a great thing running this year, isn't it? So I think that that ends up uh, reducing the power of business and making it possible for the broad values-led desires of the general population to come to the forefront. That's wonderful. I should ask him that. I can't remember. Of course, someone who is concerned about uh, the fate of people uh, everywhere. Uh, I do find this, um, this huge gap between the rich and the poor, in general, at the global level, between the rich nations and the poor nations, and also within each community there is a huge gap. Uh, this is a major source of concern, and also there is a moral dimension to this issue. Uh, also, uh, the current trend of the widening of the influence of multi-corporations in all over the world, and there negative impact upon the local economies, where sometimes the local economy, uh, the individual businesses and so on, gets really kind of overwhelmed and, and undermined in the locally in many other parts of the world. This raises serious 
not only practical but also moral issue. Uh, but as to how to solve this, how to how to correct this, His Holiness was saying that he he hasn't got any idea. I think it is empowering the rest of us. I think it's empowering consumers. If businesses knew that they would make more money if they were addressing this issue of the gap between rich and poor, they would do it. If consumers say, I will, pref I will buy your product mm -hmm. instead of the competitors if you are acting in the interest of the society as a whole. But the mm -hmm. truth always sells, and that's, you know, that's, that, that is what you suggest to lead each of us by example. Uh, I, I, my brother, he was a very famous rapper, he sold a lot of sneakers. Here's his sneaker, I'm selling it to you right now. <laughs> These are called the fat classics, right? <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> I'll send Ben a pair. So my brother came to me. He said, I want to run your sneaker company. We'll make an offering at a sneaker. And I said, they only wear Nike. I'm going to get all, I'm going to say quickly though, we made an offering at a sneaker and we, and we made economic justice the basis of our campaign. It's equal high quality education and subjects that matter to people and say that's the basis of our sneaker campaign and that's why we're here to kind of change our own mindset so we can uplift poor people. But it, it, but it was a good example. It's a good example that that, that was a, a success story. It was important. Damn. And it made money. I got a big, I got a big house now. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it'll get your sneakers back. <laughs> I don't know this brand, but I'm probably the only one in the room that does it. <laughs> this fat farm, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm an Ann Taylor person. <laughs> but uh, these stories, I, I think, are more important than simply the success of the business. They lead to the success of the individual. That person who has made that purchase has started on an odyssey of redefinition of self. They have started to define themselves as a person who joins with others over concern for economic justice, for people. <laughs> that redefinition of self is possible through certain kinds of consumption and both of these companies, I believe, are examples of that. So uh, I love these stories, and thank you for sharing them. Thank you. The Solnits were saying that in classical Buddhism, there are um, four factors of uh, happiness or pursuit. No, no. Uh, you have a spiritual, a spiritual practice and wealth, and the result of spiritual practice is liberation, and the result of wealth is the fulfillment of desire. Mm. So these four things are three. These are seen as factors of happiness. Mm. Most business people probably don't pay that much attention uh, to the Dalai Lama, but there are some that do. More than that, there's a whole lot of consumers that pay attention to the Dalai Lama. The key is for those consumers to realize that they have the power to take the spiritual philosophies of the Dalai Lama and actualize them into how they interface with business. If you talk to any person who has gone through a transformation and begun to show a real caring attitude, each one of them will talk about an incident, a particular moment where they were personally involved, where they heard somebody saw something differently, and it changed everything for them. The Dalai Lama has that power. He's able to do that. He's able to grab a hold of people and move them.
the planet is our only home. So they take care of nature or environment. It's not something what's the day. So, uh, taking care of the, the, the planet environment is not really uh, a religious or any moral or spiritual uh, ideal. It's a question of one's own survival. Just like taking care of one's own room, one's own house. Uh, it's rather foolish. In the room, temperature is very cold. Then they use furniture and burn. <laughs> Foolish. Uh, uh, so now I'm eager is it to learn more from a specialist through interact. So I'm very happy. <laughs> Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you. Uh, what we do know about the environment is that every uh, living system on earth is in rapid decline and the rate of decline is accelerating. Uh, there is not one peer-reviewed scientific paper published in the last 20 years that conflicts with that statement. But I think more importantly the living system that is pervasive that affects us all uh, is climate. And I don't believe the world has fully accepted or understood the implications of climate change. Climate change, if it is gradual over the next hundred years, will have horrendous results in terms of drought, flooding, the ability of forests, to survive. You know, the 21st century, we are going to be oppressed by ourselves. You know, the loss of, 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 of so much that we hold dear in terms of our environment. And the question is, how will we be as a culture? Who will we be? Uh, are we preparing ourselves, you know, with a kind of awareness, you know, and, and attention that will allow us to care for others? The Dalai Lama has a lot to offer the world, I think, for the 21st century. How to, in a sense, reach out. How do we prepare ourselves for a world that will suffer grievously uh, in the decades to come? The good news, however, <laughs> is that there are over 100,000 non-governmental organizations citizen-based organizations, institutes, working today on this subject. And it is the most unusual movement the world has ever seen. Because it has no leader, it has no dogma, nobody's in charge, there is no orthodoxy. And yet, if you query each of these groups, and ask them for their values, which principles inform their work, what is their framework of understanding, you will find that there is virtually no disagreement between these groups all over the world. And what I want to suggest is that there is an ethical revolution emerging in the world today in this movement because it is the first movement that didn't arise from central authority or an idea from a charismatic male vertebrate. <laughs> and this should give us a great deal of hope. <laughs> this is the most powerful movement the world has ever seen. I think Paul has really conveyed uh, the crucial issue of our time in the sense that the house is on fire. Uh, well, if the house is on fire, uh, one thing we know is that our solutions have to be commensurate with the scale of the problem. And I guess a key question for this dialogue today is, you know, is this inner revolution, this inner spiritual revolution that the Dalai Lama talks about in his new book, uh, really a key tool to help us with that 
outer revolution, so to speak, uh, uh, to maintain the body of the earth for future generations of all life on earth. And, and in many respects, uh, I'm very excited about that and, and think that, in fact, not only uh, can it, but uh, it, it's, it's key to the next step. If the band of social movements around the world, the human rights movement, the environmental movement, if they get into this and get the gist of what the Dalai Lama is saying and incorporate that into their outer behavior, their, this is the family of families, the anti-globalization, the pro-better world society that is able to operate on a scale commensurate with the problems we see with economic globalization and George Bush. And so when people ask me, well, gee, aren't you bummed out at the destruction of the rainforest? Uh, my answer is I'm so excited about understanding the leverage points around which we can make a difference and save the rainforest. And ultimately, of course, you cannot save the forests of Tibet or the tropical rainforest of the Amazon until you make that systemic shift of society globally, right? And hence the World Trade Organization and those gatherings. But just decrying uh, the evil ways of the WTO and corporate-led economic globalization isn't sufficient, you know. We have to champion the better world as well. And, you know, that's the stage of the global environmental movement now where we're going to add some counterbalance to the negativity. But we also do need the spiritual leaders like yourself uh, to come to those gatherings. So I want to invite you to an upcoming World Trade Organization meeting where you'll find many of the people in this audience and uh, many of the people on Link TV. Uh, that family of families that is that force, I think, of compassion that can create this spiritual revolution. So uh, come if you can. We'd like to have you. Uh, listening to your presentation, it in fact reinforced my own general belief that uh, when dealing with uh, difficult problems. Um, it's very important to appreciate the wider ramifications of that problem so that we don't have a kind of a simplistic understanding of that problem only from one angle. So what seems to be important on our part when we tackle these problems is to try to find a way of coordinating efforts from all the various movements so that individual groups or individual you know, approaches could concentrate on their strength, but through the coordination, we will be able to look at, deal with all the various dimensions of a given problem. As I understand it, it is the plants that made the world livable for higher life. The activity of the plants that gave us seasons, pure water, healthy soil, breathable air, Looking at the world condition and the challenges that we are facing, what I have come to realize is that the unifying solution to many of these global problems is simply to replant the world. The planet knows exactly how to heal itself, and we just need to give it that opportunity. I believe so that I believe bringing this message to people in places of influence and power, especially uh, someone like His Holiness, who is actually you know, the, the embodiment of these dharmic ethical principles, is very valuable because our world leaders need to know, ecologically speaking, the world is in crisis. And the solution is really to put our attention on shifting our social priorities. Now, the key to this particular global work, as I understand it, is the medicinal plants in particular. And the medicinal plants provide a wide range of therapeutic functions. But basically, they can be summed up as providing some kind of nutrition or strength or vitality to the body and detoxifying, cleansing the organs and the systems. And these basic functions are functions that modern drugs basically cannot do. Now, my particular approach to doing this is working with community gardens and school gardens. And through this particular work, 
I think that something could evolve that would actually be a kind of teaching of these ethical principles by example through this process of giving medicines and teaching people the relationship with plants. And um, if we're going to have medicine in the future, we have to start replanting gardens of medicine everywhere to see the world as a garden of healing medicine as it once was. So thank you. Well, I see your, your, your sort of interest of, you see, help, or replant and the lifestyle more uh, farmer-like way. It's very good. It's a closer. That way, bring closer relation with nature. After all, we are part of nature. I think it is false sort of thinking. Uh, we have a scientific sort of knowledge and the technology. So we can change, we can overwhelm nature. I think that is short-sighted. Hmm. <laughs> if as a result of human action, uh, we cause a, a, a dramatic change uh, in, in the ecosystem, uh, in the uh, destructive way, then um, all the human beings, including the scientists, and including our wonderful technology, there's only one path, the path to destruction. Now for that, and the most important is education. So awareness through education. It seems the human thinking uh, at the beginning of 20th century and the later part of 20th century, I think much change. So I think there is basis for optimism. What do you think? I go to colleges and universities and you know, students would be oh my god, you know, I just was born in the wrong time and, and I'm just saying no, you ch this is the best possible time. You couldn't have chosen a more interesting time to be alive because essentially the 21st century is about reimagining mm -hmm. what it means to be a human being on earth. You know, and can you imagine a better time to live? There's a Tibetan expression which is um, a threshold that would determine whether one goes in one direction or the other direction. Um, so probably uh, we could say that the uh, the 21st century, the beginning of the 21st century, is really that kind of turning point which will determine whether humanity as a whole is going to go into the positive direction or into go to the dis destructive direction. Mm. So it is very, very crucial, critical. Uh, critical and very crucial. So, so some questions we can ask. If you have any other question, I want to ask you a question, Your Holiness. When we were in Costa Rica one time, we were walking up a volcano and you saw one plant there, and you jumped into the ditch and ran up to the plant, and you took the leaf and asked for your picture to be taken, and you were wearing a very silly hat, mm. but it looked good with sun hat, mm. and then you were so happy. Then you said, my next life, I want to be a naturalist. You Listen to that. <laughs> I see. Do you remember that? I can't remember. Huh? I can't remember. So you, you don't want to be a naturalist, you still don't want to be a naturalist? No, I don't like what touch me something. Someone was saying that um, so far as desire is concerned, he wish he has hundred hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Or a thousand. <laughs> thousand. It was kind of like a pilgrimage to come here, actually, as a um, Buddhist meditator. It represents an extraordinary opportunity to discuss things that are very close to my heart with somebody who understands the importance of them. I actually don't think the Dalai Lama does have anything important to say about environmentalism, and I think he would be the first to say that himself. His importance to the subject is really awareness. He brings a quality of awareness, as does Buddhist practice. When I asked him on stage if he would be willing to do a pilgrimage to a global economic summit, I didn't expect that on stage he would come back and, and say, yeah, I'll be with you tomorrow, let's go. On the other hand, people shouldn't be shy about asking people of his ilk to do things, and then, you know, we'll see. 
so, in a way that today's forum does provide His Holiness a wonderful opportunity to say, yes. uh, speak, but then sometimes he was saying that if he speaks too much, then he gets um, uh, Scold. reprimands from this oh, yeah. end and scolding oh, yeah. from the other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but generally, I feel that. That's one Buddhist monk. It doesn't matter. No more, no less. But I have some connection with six million people there. So unfortunately, sometimes the Chinese government angry with me, then they tight policy in Tibet. Mm -hmm. So Tibetans suffer. Mm -hmm. You know, His Holiness is a representative of uh, an oppressed people, six million people, and um, and he's in exile and so on. And he also is, the, is a, personally in a hostage situation, you could say. There are six million hostages held by the Chinese dictatorship. So the Dalai Lama is not really free as a representative of his people to simply just you know, be out there wild-eyed like Moses in the street. <laughs> of course, uh, politics, I believe, one instrument to serve society. So basically, Politics is another form of human activities. So whether you see that, uh, that becoming some uh, positive or dirty, uh, that depends on the uh, politician's sort of motivation. Hmm? Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you. So Dr. Caldecott, please. I um, will speak today as a physician and a doctor and I want to quote Albert Einstein. Oh. Einstein said way back, he said, the splitting of the atom changed everything except the way man thinks. Thus we drift and, towards uh, unparalleled catastrophe. In the nuclear age, we've built hundreds of nuclear power plants, which are full of radioactivity that lasts for half a million years. In each nuclear power plant is as much radiation as a thousand Hiroshima bombs. There are two nuclear power plants 34 miles from New York. If one of them goes and the wind's blowing towards New York, millions of people will have such a dose of radiation their hair will fall out, they will start bleeding and vomiting and die within one or two weeks. And then years later, millions will get cancer. And I must say, I get quite cross with people who say, oh, I can't bear to think of the nuclear thing. It's too awful for me. I mean, who do they think they are? Well, now, you might want to be suicidal for yourself, but what about your children? How dare you say, oh, I don't have the energy to do, deal with this. You know, I'm scared enough already by the terrorists and stuff. I mean, for God's sake, haven't we got the guts to take on these issues and fix them? Of course we have. In Iraq... America used radioactive weapons in 1991 near Basra. They used 360 tons. In this last Gulf invasion, America used 1,000 to 2,000 tons. It's called uranium weapons. And they burn when they hit the tank and produce tiny particles that are breathed into the lung. Children are 20 times more sensitive to radiation than adults. They are very sensitive. In Basra, the incidence of childhood cancer has gone up five times. And the women giving birth to babies are giving birth to very severe deformities. The incidence of those deformities has gone up five times. Depleted uranium weapons, nuclear power, nuclear waste and nuclear war, that's a medical issue which far surpasses anything we see in the world now, such as AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria. Because if there's a nuclear war, that's the final epidemic of everyone and everything. And no one's looking at it. It's the elephant in the sitting room that everyone looks around and totally ignores. So in a way, what you're doing is uh, kind of you know, inspiring terror in all of us because you're really frightening us. <laughs> it's appropriate to be frightened because then we can save our lives. So, I think as a Buddhist, I always stress that eventually this planet, small planet, should be 
completely demilitarized. Yeah. This I always yeah. is talking. Yeah. But mm, uh, some countries are still sort of or say wow. they uh, worship guns. So, uh, so under that circumstances, uh, things are very, very complicated. But meantime, we must have some kind of blueprint. Long run, yeah. this world should be demilitarized. Yeah. And as a first step, denuclearization. Yeah. That's the first step. <laughs> so I'm very, very glad. You see, you mentioned uh, the consequences as a result of your, I think, very clear awareness. So more, more publicize, more because of the educate, Ed, educate more and more people, and especially the younger generation. What I've done is set up a centre in Washington called the Nuclear Policy Research Institute to take on the right-wing think tanks in the media and to set the agenda on the nuclear issue so they don't, we do. People in the White House now, either they understand it and don't care, or they don't understand it, but we need a revolution in this country. It's this country that's deciding the fate of the earth. But nobody will listen. I'll talk. So I'm going to do the chulu to say that. So so chulu to you again. So sometimes uh, it feels as if one is just talking to oneself. Mm. <laughs> so here, few people, uh, and you also, I think, uh, you also, you see, when, when someone you see, say something, uh, something or say, uh, meaningful, and you shout and, and that, that, that. Well, that is not much, not much meaning. <laughs> but these points must keep in your mind. And after this sort of meeting, then whatever way, any level, you must make effort. That's our goal. <laughs> Sometimes American, this is the reaction, this is childish. I'm frankly speaking, sometimes I do feel a little childish. Oh, shouting, shouting. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. And, and especially some politicians uh, sort of making, but you know, making empty slogan. Oh, then the voters like <laughs> that. <laughs> sorry, I'm yeah, sorry. Thank you, no. It's very true. Well, first of all, I'm very honored to uh, be here and to share uh, with you and be in your presence. Uh, we all have been wrestling with the, uh, with the tone of spiritualism as it relates to social and governmental environment. I grew up as a uh, youngster in the aftermath of Dr. Martin Luther King's movement. Now, I did not come out of the South, my mother did. So I grew up here in New York, in Brooklyn, where for much of my early preteen years, we thought the love ethic and what Dr. King was doing at that time, mostly in the South, was some less than effective, aggressive way. As I grew older, I began to understand that we are programmed to think that those with money and those with the power to execute violence are those that we should look up to. We began to understand that Dr. King using the love ethic, using the power of forgiveness, using the power of sacrificing oneself for a greater cause, did more to change America for people like me than anybody that had money or military power. Yet, we don't talk about that. In the span of history, what will matter is if we keep teaching humanity that revenge and hate and who has the biggest gun and who has the most money is the answer. When most of the world is looking for clean water, 
and clean sanitation and a way to educate their children. And most of the world would gravitate to getting in line with those that would raise that. You coming here is against the grain of a culture that has told our people that the size car you have and the size house you have and the amount of jewelry you have determines your worth. That is not your worth. What you're able to do for humanity mm -hmm. is your worth. And I think that your being here, your being here, I think, helps us to crystallize what authentic heroes and authentic leadership should be in a broader social context. And I humbly think that you represent that. That's why I wanted to be here this afternoon. Thank you. We, we don't want to get into you two guys are competitors. We love you both. <laughs> we are glad to have you here, but we're mainly having you here in that higher end that the Reverend mentioned. Congressman. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to His Holiness for what your life exemplifies and to the encouragement that you give all of us. I think one of the things that makes it so difficult for people today is to see a politics which professes an intention which is not consistent with the outcome, a politics which professes an intention for peace but produces war, a politics which lacks a unity of thought, word, and deed. When our nation's constitution was written, the preamble to it uh, spoke of, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. The idea of creation of a nation connected to perfection, but the work that was left to us to accomplish. So the question then arises, uh, how can we meet the challenges of our time in order to perfect this country? I would submit that the advancing tide in this world is towards human unity, towards people coming together. And that when there is an inconsistency in government policies, those kinds of policies reinforce fear and make it impossible for us to be able to connect with the deeper meaning of who we are as human beings. And so with, with that awareness, I introduced legislation into the Congress of the United States to create a new structure within the United States government. And that new structure uh, is in the form of what is called a Department of Peace, which would serve to make nonviolence, the work of Dr. King that the Reverend Sharpton talked about, make nonviolence an organizing principle in our society for domestic as well as international policy. I believe that we are in a time where we can work to make war itself archaic, that we can connect with the aspirations of people all around the world. So how to move that? How to move that direction? Well, maybe the effort that you urge the audience to do, the effort is to see to it that there is a Department of Peace. I think you could probably use a few telegrams and emails. It would be and helpful if people contacted their congressional representative mm -hmm. and said, this is the time for us to take a step in that direction. And uh, any positive word from His Holiness in terms of this kind of a proposal would be very much appreciated and I think help to, help to move this along. Look at promotion of nonviolence, peace. So naturally, I fully support about your idea is to lead world and make new sort of covering, uh, what is it? A new pattern, international relations according principle of democracy, freedom, justice, these things. Then more more people automatically come. Then I think things will change. Then I think a real meaningful discussion, I think much, much, much easier. Mm. So, thank you. And seriously, Your Holiness, we are all very, very grateful for your coming here. And we didn't want to get you in trouble by all kinds of humorous suggestions and also heartfelt suggestions. Because we all have in our heart the people of Tibet and the cause of Tibet, as we know you do. And therefore, we hope that the people of Tibet get a break 
and they, they are able to find happiness. Uh. Tibet should not be punished and ignored because they don't do terrorism, because they try a peaceful way, because they seek to talk even with those who other people would feel was righteous to hate. So we all understand this, I think, in this room, I can feel. And we all wish the very best for the people of Tibet. And we really do. From our hearts. He is many things to many people. He's a rock star. He is a phenomenon. He is a Buddhist light to millions of Americans. A screen, almost, upon which Americans project their hopes, their uh, anger, their sense of what's missing but what matters. Let, uh, you know, every American come to the Dalai Lama who wishes to and find in the Dalai Lama what he or she wants to find there. And I say, all power to tolerance, which is what he preaches. That was fabulous, very enlightening. He's very humorous. He's made everybody laugh, very put us all at ease. I just felt touched by his laughter and by him personally. the most amazing experience I've ever had. And I think the message is so important, this message of really unconditional love. We're all here to create peace, really vital, extremely important. Well said. He's done something that's hard for any human being to do, which is to not hate someone that's hurt you. I think that makes him a model. It's an important thing to to understand possibilities, you know, like what happened here, a very important thing on September 11th. Instead of slapping back, you just, like he said, you ask why. There's a reason why. This is a democracy, and it does require participation. And you need to do something. You can't just sit back and criticize. We need to organize the unrest and do something that will have some effect.